Yo everyone, welcome back to another video, welcome back to the YouTube channel, and today is another preview of the Premier League game week. Uh, there's going to be a lot of these because there's a lot of fixtures coming up, and we'll try to get guests on as best as possible, people. I want to uh, do this show with a guest each time, but it's very hard to get people onto the channel. And also with Arsenal West Ham coming up, I'm kind of collaborating a lot with a lot of people anyway, so it's kind of hard to just rearrange that. But we will have guests when we do this more often, but... For now, you just got me, unfortunately. But make sure to leave a like on the video and subscribe if you're new. We are on the road to 1K, as we all know here. And we're on 600 and something subscribers. So big up to you lot for the support, man. It's been amazing. But yeah, obviously, we won't be talking about West Ham Arsenal in this uh, video because I'll give my prediction and that's it. Because we're doing a lot of previews on the channel, a lot of previews on other people's channels as well. And you're seeing this on 12, 12 p.m. Friday. Um so check out the preview with Waffle TV, Abs, shout out to Abs. Check out the preview of Alfie. And on 7 p.m. on Friday, the day you're watching this, I'm going to be on uh, Josh's channel. I'm going to be on True Guna. Uh, so go and check that out with me and Early Doors Football TV as well. And uh, yeah, we're going to have the London Divided podcast uh, with, uh, well, the show with uh, Melon and Alfie at 10 as well. So we're going to be talking about this fixture a lot anyway. But... Listen, let's get straight into it. The main event game, obviously, is Liverpool versus Manchester City. Now, we saw the highlights for the City game. I didn't watch the game because I was watching the Arsenal game against Sporting. But we saw how City crumbled. We saw the fact that it was them pretty much put uh, taking players off because they thought they won the game and they need to rest players because of the fixtures coming up. And Pep made a triple change. And then it all unfolded from there. The high line was still there, right at the end of the game. Very um, suicidal high line. And they drew to Feyenoord 3-3 at home. This is We've never seen Man City crumble like this. You could argue that in the World Cup season, that City were crumbling a little bit. You could argue that um, even last season when they lost the Wolves, and I think they lost two in a row or something like that. I can't remember. It was just the games they didn't have Rodri and they lost. And yes, they don't have Rodri now, but it isn't just Rodri. It isn't just because of one player. And even then, if we're talking the standard of Manchester City, it's a genuinely a disgrace if one player is trying to keep you up for, throughout the whole time. Because let's be real, yeah? You are Manchester City. You are you was renowned mainly before 2020 or 2021 for having two players in each position for the most part. And not necessarily all different players and 24 players necessarily, but you had two players in each position that could do you that could do you a job in each position of the highest of quality. We are not seeing that right now. We are seeing probably the most washed set of midfielders that Man City have ever produced. 2024 Bernardo Silva and Matteo Kovacic, who is a good player when he's not the lone six, but is a squad player at best if we're talking a title winning team. And Ilkay Gundogan, who has been shocking, genuinely shocking ever since he's returned. We've got a Kevin De Bruyne who doesn't really get to play as much and then watching his minutes and it's not going to be the same De Bruyne naturally because he's getting old, older and stuff like that. You've got a James McAtee who doesn't play. I don't know if I've missed anyone. Rodri's injured. You're playing Rico Lewis there. Rico Lewis had a bad season. I think he started quite well, but overall it's been quite bad. That is, that is the most washed set of midfielders, washed set of profiles I've seen. And I thought it would be better than this. I was the one that, at the start of the season, hyping them up. And when I watched Man City against us, and yes, it was against us, we're shit. But they actually started better than they usually start. I thought they're going to kick on. They could only get better from here. And yes, Rodri got injured. Cool. But just with the way they were passing, the way they were opening up teams, they genuinely looked a threat. I'm even more of a threat of last season. I thought they actually learned from some of the problems they had last season. But when you look at it in retrospect and look at it in hindsight, they have not learned one thing. They have just fallen off a cliff. And this was kind of always going to happen. But what we always think is uh, Man City will figure it out because they're Man City and because they always tend to figure it out. However, in this case, that, is, that isn't going to be the case at all. Let's be real. Because when it comes to Man City, they usually capitalise and refresh their squad whenever they, there is a problem. They failed to do that. They just brought Gundogan back. They've got Savio in, great signing, um, and he will he will become good because um, Man City players, when they have that first season to settle in, usually become good, unless you're Doku. But 
Savio looks like a decent player. However, they need that Kevin De Bruyne depth properly. Like Phil Foden isn't doing it. I and we were talking about this on Omar's channel yesterday about how everything's kind of around Haaland, but you're not giving him the service anyway. It's funny how Haaland is the top goal scorer, and he still probably isn't getting the service he deserves. In fact, he probably never have got the service that he deserves, especially outside when Kevin De Bruyne is not there. And people kind of need to put, if you don't respect Kevin De Bruyne by now, you kind of need to put a bit more respect on his name because without Matt, because without Kevin De Bruyne, Man City are so fucked. And I didn't think he'd had this much impact. I knew how, obviously, how fantastic Kevin De Bruyne has been. But you didn't think that one man could just disappear like that. And then your whole pretty much build-up disappears and your whole creativity disappears. The problem is people are pinning two players on Haaland to mark him out the game. And then there's nobody, none of the midfielders and none of the wingers are following up on a second ball to have a shot from outside the box or make a later run with inside the box. So the few chances that Phil Foden gets, he has to finish them because you ain't getting any of them. The ball ain't going to you. The ball is trying to go to Haaland and half the time it's a half-hearted ball because without De Bruyne, who's the who's a good crosser? Like Savio is a decent crosser. Doku isn't. Grealish can be, but not from winger, not from a winger position. Not from a winger position. Like, I've said this for time creation, not fucking winger, but that's Man City for you. They, you got to lie in your own bed for that. Good the one kind of used to put those kind of free balls in sometimes, but come on, man. Good the one looks so much. Kovacic ain't the best when it comes to like Ranger passing. Even Rodri wasn't. So how did they get in much when De Bruyne's not there? Mateus Nunes needs to start for Man City. The guy doesn't start enough, and the guy will bring you a whole new energy. They need runners. Mateus Nunes is a runner. He's got energy in midfield. That's what they need. That's exactly what they need. Um, however, this is where it gets st sticky for them. It gets a bit techy. Because they're going to Anfield. They're going to fucking Liverpool. The hardest ground in England to go. Like, Liverpool don't lose at Anfield much. Nottingham Forest beat them. But no one else has gone there to beat them. And apart from that game, they've looked on form. They've looked on form. They look ridiculous. I watched, obviously, some of you were on the watch along yesterday for the Liverpool Real Madrid game. And Liverpool look like the champions of Europe. With Real Madrid, I get they have injuries as well. But come on, we can't keep discrediting a Liverpool win every time they win a game. Every time Liverpool win a game, we can't be discredited. It. Like, for me, it's actually kind of amazing to carry this on from what Jurgen Klopp has done to slot in, no pun intended, and kind of put your own ideas onto a squad that's pretty much the same because they haven't signed anyone for the first team. And there you go. The only thing I will say, I'm going to try and get this... No, no, because I actually forgot uh, to look this up whilst doing this video. I heard Kanate has got an MCL. Uh, but I'm going to check that quickly. Because when it comes to Ibrahim and Kanate, that this guy has been one of the best players of the season so far. Um, so he did hobble off the pitch. Connor Bradley picked up an injury as well, of course, as well. Trent is just coming back. And Joe Gomez could probably slot in. But even with, let, let's say hypothetically, with Liverpool, that it's... Uh, um. What's it called? Let's say Trent comes back in. And it's a back four. Trent, Gomez, Van Dijk, Robertson. Despite the fact that Robertson hasn't been great this season. Despite the fact that Trent can be go out 1v1. Since he haven't really tested anyone 1v1 with their wingers. And they should probably put play Doku for this game. And put Mateus Nunes in midfield. With Kovacic in my opinion. Bench Gundogan. Put Foden in front. Or no, put, actually forget Foden. Put De Bruyne in front. Um, and then Savio on the right. Haaland up front. Um, but even with a back four, what I just said, that could that is going to be fine against Manchester City. I don't even think City will score. I think Liverpool are going to put City to the sword. I'm going to put them away quite comfortably, to be 100% honest with you, because it's not even just the individuals, it's the system. It's the same with Arsenal, where it's like, it's not just Saliba and Gabriel. Like, the way Arteta and the coaches organise them is very good. Very, very good. Like, the ability to keep clean sheets and stuff like that as well. And the, the ability to... Defend against like wingers that are mobile, but they're just not strong enough. So you can just put your arm there just to defend them. That's what Kanate and Van Dijk do. That's what Saliba and Gabriel do as well. Um, but even without Kanate, I think Gomez will slot in just fine. Even if it's, I don't know if Kwanzaa's fit, but even if it's Kwanzaa for just one game, I think he'll come in and do a good job, especially at Anfield. 
Um, I don't think Juan's is that good in terms of like, I don't think he'll be ready to be a regular starter for Liverpool ever. But I think he's a good young player that could be a good squad player. That's also a fine thing to to think about as well. Um, As long as they don't go a bit too pragmatic, they can put seeds in the sword. They just need to play the similar teams they've been playing. Whether it's Diaz or Gakpo on the left, it doesn't seem to matter when it comes to Liverpool as well. They just look just as effective. They look just as dangerous. Mohamed Salah on the right. When it is, like, I don't rate Darwin Nunes, but to be fair, if you just treat him as a squad player, you can come in and do a good job. You can come in and do a good job for one game. He's just not that type of player you want to win a league. I still think Liverpool need to buy players. But to be honest with you, my I said this on Omar's channel as well. My only concern when it came to Liverpool was, for example, I don't think Liverpool could carry this on in sense of not in the short term, but the long term for the fact that they've got a very small squad and they don't seem to invest that much either. But I'm looking at it right now, and who else is going to? But Arsenal and Man City. I don't. Th- I don't. I think Man City should do things in January. I don't think they will do things in January, which is bad. I don't think Arsenal will do things in January. Arsenal had a terrible transfer window. I think if you're looking at if you're Liverpool right now, they seem to be the most coached, the most balanced, like the best coached and most balanced team right now in the Premier League. They can carry this on. I still think get a midfielder to help Gravenberch out, get a six to help Gravenberch out, or to somewhat re-energize a little bit. Just for, even if it's a midfielder, just for depth someone you can trust that could come in and do a good job in the squad. Like, even the players that I don't really particularly rate for Liverpool, like the Sabozalines, etc., like the Darwin Nunes, um, even Luis Diaz before this season, Arnie Slot's done a fantastic job with them. Like, it's generally comes to a point where whoever comes in does a good job. Like, and, or does the job that they need to do. Even when it was a hard away day against Crystal Palace, a game they could have drawn. Someone comes in and just Makes makes a name for themselves in that speci- in that specific game. They're grinding results out, which is something you can't really be doing at this stage of the season. You want to do it mainly at the results based end of the season, but nobody else is performing well. And to be honest, I don't see Arsenal and Man City. I see Man City getting better. Don't get me wrong, um, but I don't see them winning the league this season. There's a reason why people don't win five in a row. They've broken records, but there's a reason why you get to a point where you become complacent because that's why these records exist. Because you think you're going to win it the next season as well. Oh, we've we've beaten a record. We're, we're going to beat it again. No, that's not how it works. You get slapped in the face with reality right there. And Liverpool just come in and do maybe another league title. That's what I think is going to happen. If I was to predict it now, I'd say Liverpool win the league. And it's generally not being reactionary because usually I'm the one at this stage that is defending Manchester City saying, well, you guys always do this with City. You guys always put City down. But this is generally not normal. This is not normal. I've not seen... like I Put it this way, City definitely won't win the game. I can't see Man City winning the game at all. This is probably my favourite fixture of the season in terms of football because Liverpool-Man City has been the fixture. It just doesn't have enough hostility in it for me um, for it to be better than the the prime Man United-Arsenal sort of rivalry. Um, Even when I was growing up in the 2010s, that was still a better rivalry, of course, than what we're seeing now, in my opinion, just because of the hostility, even though both teams were falling off compared to their standards. Um, but that's another conversation for another day. I'm going to say Liverpool win that game quite comfortably. I don't even think Man City score. I'll start doing score predictions as in like score. Like I'll actually predict the score instead of just just the result. I'm going to go 3-0 Liverpool. People think that's bad, but come on. If we're looking at form, I think it only makes sense to predict that. But by the way, guys, I don't usually do well with predictions when it comes to score predictions, uh, season predictions as well. So the Mike's curse is well and truly on. And that's why I'm share FPL as well. Uh, let's get on to... Okay, the next best game I'd say is uh, Chelsea Aston Villa. I think Chelsea Aston Villa is probably the next best game because Aston Villa haven't been great. They 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 somewhat got the wrong decision against Juventus when they scored right at the end. I saw that. I don't know why that goal wasn't given. Um, they beat che- well. They beat Chelsea at Stamford Bridge last season. Obviously, a different manager under Pochettino, and uh, they drew with each other. But Villa actually bottled the game against Chelsea um, at their ground. But Chelsea actually got a controversial goal disallowed in that game. Um, to be honest with you, I can see Chelsea putting Villa to the sword quite comfortably as well. Um, Enzo Maresca is very good at managing his squad. I think there's a lot that comes into play by substitutions, maybe. I've heard that criticism come up and I understand why. Because I actually thought at the start of the season they were, he was doing like his substitution is quite well. He seems a bit dipped a little bit with that, but I think he's very good at also keeping the same shape in his system, 
but just adjusting the players' roles a little bit. So this time it was against Leicester, it was Kukurea hugging the touchline, Felix and Palmer in the pockets because they didn't have a traditional winger, so Kukurea was hugging it. And to be honest, I'd argue, I'd argue that in terms of like most important players to Chelsea right now, Kukurea is probably top three, I'd say. Him, Caicedo and Palmer. Because the reason why I say that, this guy, no matter what role he's been told to do, he does it well throughout the whole pitch. Like he's just his spatial awareness, his positional awareness, his technical ability, his reading of the game on and off the ball. That's why he's one of the most important because he's either playing on the touch or playing inverted and he doesn't look out of place in any position that he plays on the pitch. I think he's probably top three most important players for Chelsea right now, if I'm being 100% honest. With Villa, uh, more, I like Morgan Rogers. Been one of my favourite players to watch this season. So I'm expecting a good game from him, as always. Um, Oli Watkins has been way below his standards. I kind of want to see, as a neutral, just John Duran start in this game, just to see how he does. Um, I don't suspect he's too happy. I know he signed a new contract, but I don't suspect he's too happy with being the guy to just come off the bench all the time. He wants to push the start. I think everyone needs to switch it up a little bit when it comes to certain positions um, where players can come in. I know they've got a couple injuries still, but... Come on, like you can, you can, you can do a lot more with that squad. I think Villa obviously still need investment. They didn't have a, a gleaming transfer window, but they can, they can still do better. Like especially in their defense. Obviously, Tyron Mings is coming back as well. Or no, Tyron Mings is back. Sorry, I think Paul Torres had a decent season. To be honest, I just think he's slightly like he, he, Paul Torres is what Paul Torres is. He's very good on the ball, but he's very weak when it comes to marking physical strikers and sometimes a bit too complacent. Um, but other than that, very good. Uh, it's interesting seeing whether Matson or Digne start in this game from the highlights against Crystal Palace. Matson was somewhat at fault for the first goal. Uh, Digne started against Juventus. He obviously can't really be starting like three games in one week and stuff like that. I, with the demands that he's doing on the pitch with him being pretty much a fly wing back in their system. Emmy Martinez has been below standards ever since the first international break. Um, but he's still Emmy Martinez at the end of the day. Still one of the best goalkeepers in the league. Still rises to the occasion when he can. Um, I think this is going to be a very good game. However, I think with the contrast of styles, I think it actually benefits Chelsea a lot more than it does with Aston Villa due to the high line Villa play. And I think Chelsea will have a lot more control on the ball, where there's Emery might go a little bit more pragmatic and it, I don't think it's going to work. Um, I actually think, I, I, I could be wrong, but I think Chelsea's away record is better than their home record. I could be wrong with that, but at the same time, I, I, I still expect Chelsea to win this. I th I'm going to go I'm going to go 2-1. I think Chelsea will edge it on the scoreline, but I think they'll dominate in terms of the general play of the game. Um, what fixture should we talk about next? Uh, Man United-Everton. Man United-Everton is also at 1.30 at the same time as Chelsea Aston Villa. Obviously, Ruben Amarim got a bit of a reality check in terms of the fact that he's realised that, wow, if I was him, I'd be like, wow, my players are really, really shit. And I said this before on multiple times, apart from Kobe Mainu, uh, Diogo Dallo and Ahmad Diallo. Yeah, Diogo Dallo, Ahmad Diallo. I, I, forget the new signings for just a second. Apart from them three, I don't think any of them should be able to survive in that Amarim system. The reason why I say this, yeah, I'm going to go through every player. Anano could work, you never know, but we've seen that either he pulls off a masterclass or a disaster class. However, he's been decent this season. Um, Lissandra Martinez, defending in wide areas as a centre-back is not a strong suit, but you never know, three in the back could help him, but I think he'll get caught out too many times. Johnny Evans is too old. Like We shouldn't even be, be talking about him, really. Like The guy was a very underrated centre-back in his time, but come on, like let's be real with it. Uh, just, nah. Harry Maguire, no. Nah. Squad player, maybe, but no. Victor Lindelof, can't believe he's still there. Uh... And I'm, I'm not talking about the new signings, as I just said. So I'm going to skip over Delict for now and Lenny Yoro. Uh, but also, I think Maserati is a great signing. And I think he, he could be a three and a back option as well. The way, the way they put that against Ipswich and Amadiello on the right wing back role, I think Amarim did well with that. I actually didn't think they played that bad, considering the players they have. Um, Garnacho, Rashford, and Bruno Fernandes as your front three is awful. Um, I. They're not going to get the best out of that. They they will give you a moment where they will win a game. I'm sure they'll win this game. Um, and I'm sure one of them or two of them even may score. And he might go with a similar front three. But at the same time, I just... 
on a consistent basis where it comes to how they can do for the long term. Don't think they'll give you decent seasons week in, like year in, year out. People be like, but God, Acho's young. Age in football is the most overstated thing as well. We don't talk about Harden's age when he's doing well. We don't talk about Saka and Foden's age when they're doing well. No one says, but they're still young. We only talk about them when they're trying to defend the player. Now, yes, to a certain extent, the only reason why I say you like he's still young, cool. If he's still young, then don't play him as a regular starter week in, week out for your club. Play him as a super sub. Play him as a squad player. Because you're going to get criticised the same way every other footballer does. And that is how it works, man. He's not, de- he's not going to develop at that club. And he's not going to fit that system. It's similar to the Van Gaal situation where in this in these three at the back systems, if you're a winger, and you see this in every system, you saw it with some Chelsea wingers at, um, under Tuchel. If you're a winger in a three at the back system, you're kind of fucked in a way because you've either got to play the inside 10 in the 3 4 2 one or you got to be a wing back. I remember uh, Louis Saha, I'd say Louis Saha, Wilfred Zaha said that under Van Gaal, as a winger, you have to be either a wing back or a striker. Nothing more, nothing less. Because he because of the way he plays, he played 3-5-2 at times, played 3-4-2-1 at times. Like that was what he played. So I don't know why my camera's doing doing the madness. But that's why the Rashfords ain't gonna survive. That's why the Garnachos ain't gonna survive. And Amarim won't succeed unless these players leave. Let's let's carry on with the players. Yeah, Luke Shaw in 2024 has just come back. It's, it's not a coincidence that him and Mason Mount have just come back from injury, for example. I'm just going to turn on my lighting quickly. <sighs> That's better. Um, with Luke Shaw and Mason Mount, it's not a coincidence that they've just come back from their injuries. But they ain't going to fit. Mason Mount may fit the system because of the whole Tuchel thing where you played in a similar system before. But with uh, Luke Shaw, we're not relying on... You can't be relying on Luke Shaw in 2024. Now, I know he can do a job in the three at the back as well. They actually have a lot of centre-back options, but a lot of them aren't good enough. I'd say they licked, like, apart from the new signings, I don't think any of them are good enough. Mazarari, Delict, and Yoro as your centre-back options in the three are decent. Any other than the centre-backs? No. Lindelof, no. Maguire, no. Martinez, no. Uh, Johnny Evans, no. Luke Shaw, no. Luke Shaw will give you a good performance once every five games, and then people will talk about him being one of the best left backs in the world again. And God forbid he plays wing back, because that man will just have a cardiac arrest. Uh, your other left wing back options, you're kind of playing Delo there, Maserari there at times. Uh, Maserari, if he's not playing in the three, unless a Delo gets injured, he'll probably be the next wing back. I know Malassi has just come back, he's been injured for a year. Um, he's actually a decent squad player. But well, we don't know what kind of Malassi is going to come back, and we don't know if he's going to fit a three in the back system rather than a a forward back where you're kind of just inverting and stuff like that. I don't know whether he's one of them fullbacks where he's better when he inverts into midfield rather than just running down the touchline or not. But to be fair, from what I've seen of him, I actually think he's like, excuse me, I actually think he's all right. With the midfield, for example, you, you like you require a lot from the midfield to do well, like in terms of passing, press resistance, roaming around with. Like just try to control the game. A and Menu can work. A is a bit of a, a running round match, but it kind of works in this system when you're restricted to a two man midfield. I know it's kind of a boxing midfield at times, and I know it's hard to break down off the ball, but there's you can still get at that with a three man midfield. And I think Kobe Menu and Agate will be should be the midfield going forward. Casemiro um, is a bit of a scapegoat at times, but it's just not going to be the same Casemiro. I think he can still do a decent job, but for the long term, you obviously have to be moved on. I'm, I'm to be honest, when Man United signed Agate, I wasn't really a fan of him. And like I know I said about the new signings and stuff, but I wasn't really a fan of that signing in the first place because every time I watched him, he always just gets run over by every midfield he comes up against. But however, Amarim knows him, so maybe that could work. But then again, we said that with Ten Hag and every Ajax player that plays for Manchester United. Um, obviously, I don't need to say anything about Anthony, the guy's shit. Um, and I said the same with Garnacho and Rashford and Bruno. I think Bruno Fernandes wasn't awful in the second half, but you could do a lot better. You could do a lot better than that. Um, especially with number 10s, the actual creators, you know, actual players that can link up. Um, it's good that Man United are linked with uh, strikers and tens for their benefit because that's what they need. Uh, Hoyland won't fit this system. Xerxes is a new player, so I'm not gonna I'm gonna reserve judgment on him, to be honest. I just 
I think he's I think he's probably the biggest scapegoat at Man United right now. Um, he's only just joined. But whereas these players year in, year out have let plenty of managers down and we don't see any criticism of them from these like top breads at Manchester United. Uh, but coming up against Everton, Everton, are, Everton fans have had enough and I could I completely understand why. Their last two games was 0-0 against us and Brentford. They don't go out to score goals. They go out to get the draw. I don't think they'll get relegated um, because the league is so shit, even despite... Uh, Ruth Van Nistelrooy going to Leicester, which we'll get on to as well. Um, still, I, 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 for me, with Everton, yeah, their, their squad isn't great, but their squad is better than what Sean Dyche is doing. He said Illiman in Dyer is not a number 10. Bro, he, that's exactly what he is. That's exactly the position that... That's his favourite position by far. It's not even that. And at Sheffield United, at, some, at times, the two up front. You could do so much more with that attack with McNeil whipping in crosses for a target man like Calvert-Lewin and Beto with Ndai just uh, just playing just in behind him and stuff like that. Pause. I don't know where Tim Ira Burnham is because he started the season well. I don't know whether Sean Dyche just doesn't like him. Maybe he's too technical for Sean Dyche. Um, but maybe the midfield is a bit of an issue for Everton. Like, Branthwaite's just come back in for defence as well. It took him a long time after... Michael Keane's been pretty much been benching Jake O'Brien. I don't know what the point of that Jake O'Brien signing was if you're not going to play him over Michael Keane, but we know that Sean Dyche is one of the managers that just has his favourites and is very negative. Um, Patterson got injured in the under-21s game for a while, so Amanda Brogia's trying to get his fitness back, so they're kind of desperate for goals right now, but I also don't think they set out to score enough, which is why I don't think they'll win this game either. I'm going to go with a 2-0 Man United win, and it'll probably be Amarim's first league win. Uh, in my opinion, but don't be surprised if Man United fuck it up. Uh, let's. I'll briefly talk about West Ham Arsenal. I think we will lose that game. I just think Arsenal will turn it around decent form right now. Forest and Sporting back to back. Obviously, we beat Newcastle, but I don't know the way we played. You can kind of see holes and gaps where we could be got at. So I'm going to go three new Arsenal. That's why I predicted on Omar Shadow, and I'll stick to that. Um, Tottenham Fulham. Tottenham Fulham. Let's talk about Tottenham Fulham. That's the last Sunday game. Um, and then we'll briefly go over every other game after that. Uh, with Tottenham Fulham, obviously Fulham lost to Wolves. It's one of those games where that's a typical Barclays result. Wolves just won their first game of the season just before the international break. They come back and they beat a, a Fulham side who's been on form. Despite it being a 4-1 result, I didn't watch the game, of course. So Fulham fans will be well more versed in their club than I am. But at the same time, they shouldn't take this to heart. They, this, should, this should actually be an opportunity for them to bounce back, as the typical phrase goes in football, um, to try and get a result at Tottenham because Tottenham's form all season has pretty much been win-loss, win-loss, win-loss. And um, also they've got Vicario injured as well. He's out for months and Ange Postacoglu has said that they're not signing a goalkeeper, so this should be quite entertaining to watch Tottenham because um, Vicario is out and forced us in goal. Now, Vicario has his faults on corners and maybe commanding his box and stuff like that, but everything else he's good at. Fraser Forster is too nimble. And we saw this in a, we see, we've seen this since the Antonio Conte season. If you guys watched the Galatasaray game as well earlier this season, you see what Fraser Forster performs like. If he's performing for the rest of the season and they actually believe in him, I think you're going to see a point where I'm just like, no, fuck this. We believe in, and fuck this about believing in Fraser Force. So we've got Alfie Whiteman and Brandon Austin, who are the two youngster goalkeepers that seem to be in the squad for Tottenham. They're trusting a youngster instead, honestly. I don't actually know how good Alfie Whiteman and Brandon Austin is, but maybe a Tottenham fan in the comments that's watching this can let me know. Um, also, as well, I think Tottenham needs to start winning, just start going on a run. Like, it's a very underinvested squad. It's a very like just it's not it's not really been taken care of. That attack is horrible. But they should be taking up confidence from beating Man City away from home, even though they always get a result at City, into the next game. However, this is what what Tottenham typically do is they win against City and then they lose against someone that they should be beating. Smith Rowe, Nelson, it will be and Traore have linked up quite well. Andreas Pereira played a bit deeper. Sander Berg obviously didn't play last game, but I think he should be back for this game, I'm sure. I think he was suspended for the last game. Or, and I'm not I'm not too sure. The only thing for Fulham for me is that they make too many defensive errors. I think other than that, 
they should be fine. Um, but I think if Fulham, again, it all comes down to who makes less errors in this game, I think it'll be a draw. I think it'll be a draw. I just think it'll be one of them days where Fulham are on it and maybe they press a bit higher and up the pitch so Tottenham can make a mistake playing up from the back. Tottenham have a couple of defensive injuries as well. Obviously, I'm recording this before the Roma game, a couple of hours before the Roma game, so I'm going to check them out in that game as well. But I think it'll be a draw. I think I'm going to go 1-1 for that game. We'll briefly go over every other game now. Brighton Southampton tomorrow. Um, Brighton on full, great result against Bournemouth away. Southampton just doing Southampton things. Uh, Brighton should win that comfortably. I'm going to go on at 3 0 Brighton. Uh, Wolves Bournemouth. Uh, Gary O'Neill against his former club. The uh, Wolves are on form right now. Bournemouth have lost a couple games in a row. I'm going to. Edge it to Wolves and say they win 2 1. I don't, I still don't rate Gary O'Neill. I don't know why people are so up his ass after winning two games. Um, he could do a lot better with that. A, a, another manager can do a lot better with that squad, put it that way. Uh, Crystal Palace, Newcastle. Uh, that screams a draw. Uh, again, Palace have been fucking awful this season. Um, but so New, Newcastle in certain aspects have been awful as well. You never know what Newcastle's going to turn up this season after we beat them. Again, I'm going to go 1 1. I'll go 1-1 one, one for that game. Nottingham Forest Ipswich. That could be a juicy 3 o'clock kickoff. I can't lie. That, that, that actually might be a good game. But I also think it'll be a draw. I just think Ipswich have the players to just like catch teams off guard. And I think they're tactically this out really well. It's just they don't have the quality in defence to just keep clean sheets. Um, I'm going to say 1-1 one, one as well for that game. So there you go. I don't know if... Van Nistelrooy comes in for this game, but Leicester face Brentford away. I think Brentford edge it. They're at home as well. Brentford at home. You don't want to face Brentford at their ground. That's one of the that's one of the teams in the Premier League where it's like long day. It's like when we talk about Newcastle away and Palace away. Brentford are one of them teams that was like you don't want to go there. So I'll say two 0 Brentford. It's two 0 Brentford. Those are all the games, and yeah, good video once again, people. Make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you are new. Uh, social media is in the description if you want to follow me on the email for the inquiries. I'm on the road to 1K subscribers. So if you can make that happen, that'll be great. I'll see you guys later. Goodbye.